ladies and gentlemen, dear Thomas, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all today at the German Development Institute, and I'm actually very, very happy that this room is so full of people who are interested in the SDGs and the Agenda 2030. My name is Wilke Weinrich, I'm a senior researcher here at the German Development Institute, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the lecture series, The United Nations at 70, Fit for the Future We Want. <coughs> I would like to warmly welcome you also on behalf of our partners, the Liaison Office of International Academic Sciences of the City of Bonn and the Forum Internationale Wissenschaften of the University of Bonn. Today is already the seventh lecture of our series and actually the second one which deals with the new 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the Sustainable Development Goals. If we look back into the 70 years of UN's history, it is striking that the Agenda 2030 indeed is unprecedented in scope. No intergovernmental declaration has ever spelled out so explicitly that social, economic and ecological sustainability belong together and indeed are indivisible, and that therefore we need to address sustainable development in all countries, rich and poor. Likewise, no intergovernmental declaration has ever promised as sweeping and transformative changes within the next 15 years in such a concrete manner as does the Agenda 2030. And surely no intergovernmental declaration has ever been worked out with uh, so big um, a participation, participation by many non-state and state actors in sort of worldwide. Not even two weeks after the adaptation of the SDGs, I'm very happy to welcome Thomas Gass, Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs from the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs in New York, here in Bonn with us. We want to hear from you and discuss with you what actually are the key achievements of this new agenda. What are the most pressing issues when it comes to the implementation? How can we shape and make sure, and we discussed this earlier today, that we actually aim for the necessary, innovative, and inclusive, and deep ways of implementing the SDGs, instead of falling back into development routines and thinking in silos, which will be the main tasks of the United Nations system in supporting the agenda's implementation. Thomas and his team at the Secretariat were deeply involved in the negotiation process, and he's now also responsible for formulating first steps towards the implementation of the, on the UN side, be it with regard to the review and monitoring mechanism, be it with regard to the UN's role in turning the SDGs into reality. Thomas brings with him wide-ranging experiences in bilateral and multilateral development cooperation before joining the Secretary General's team in 2013. He served as an ambassador and country director of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation in Nepal. Thomas also knows the UN from sort of the intergovernmental member state perspective between 2004 and 2009. He was head of the economic and development section at the permanent mission of Switzerland to the UN in New York. During this time, he held the chair of the donor group on the UN Global Compact, was vice president of the BEOC on the Commission of Population and Development, and was also vice president of the executive boards of UNDP and UNFPA. In 2007, he successfully facilitated the landmark TCPR, or what is now known as QCPR resolution, which is basically the periodic review of the General Assembly of the UN's operational activities, and which is due again next, next year. Before this headquarter experience, Thomas also worked in the field in Italia as deputy representative of UNDP in Vienna. He holds a PhD on top of this all in natural sciences from the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Zurich. Thomas, I'm very happy that you're with us, and you came all the way from New York to join us. Before I give you the word, I would also like to introduce today's discussant, Imre Scholz, who is Deputy Director here at the German Development Institute. It's a great pleasure to have you here in this function. For more than 20 years now, Imre has been working on international environment and climate policy, and also on the issue of sustainability or sustainable development. Over the last three years, she has been following the SDG process in detail, giving input and also publishing on it in various formats. And actually, I think the last time the two of you met was um, at the summit in New York. 
Here at the German Development Institute, where Emma has been working in different functions since 1992, she played a crucial role for establishing the research area environment and development at the Institute. As a sociologist by training, she holds a PhD from the Free University of Bonn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, nice to <laughs> In addition to the SDG agenda, her research focus includes questions of climate justice, the local and global dimensions of sustainability, global environmental governance, and forest policy. Ima is also a member of the German Council for Sustainable Development, and she's a member of the Advisory Commission on Sustainable Development of the Council of the Evangelical Church in Germany. And she served as the Themen Patin, I did not really know how to translate that into English, for ecological sustainability in the process of establishing the Zukunftskarte unit. So Emma, I'm also looking very much forward to your comment on Tom's lecture, which will be 20 to 30 minutes. Emma will have um, five to 10 minutes as a comment, and then we go into a discussion. But one last issue before I start, uh, before not I start, but Thomas starts, I would like to raise your attention to our Twitter hashtag, which we have been using for the lecture series. Um, if you want to tweet about this evening, please use, and now I have to say it, we don't see it, it's hashtag UN in capitals, at 70 and BN in capitals again. So UN at 70 BN. And now Thomas, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Silke Weinlich, for the kind introduction. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a delight to be here. And uh, let me start by thanking the German Development Institute for organizing this lecture and uh, for the proactive way um, in which its staff has contributed to the thinking and the debate supporting the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. On the flight yesterday, I read a speech which Chancellor Merkel gave in June 2012 to the Council for Sustainable Development. The, the comprehensive vision and the intellectual leadership in that speech is a clear testimony to the depth and the maturity of the debate on sustainable development in Germany. The adoption of the 2030 Agenda together with the Sustainable Development Goals and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda a few days ago at the United Nations is a truly historic milestone. This 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development with its 17 goals and 169 targets is an integrated plan of action for people, planet, and prosperity. It is a shared vision of humanity for transforming our world, strengthened by the commitment to leave no one behind. And yet, we are not naive. We all recognize the fractured reality our world is facing today, and why it might seem so difficult to line up behind this agenda's vision and optimism. Ladies and gentlemen, the 2030 Agenda is truly a silver lining in a dark cloud. In the next few minutes, I would like to give you my sense of why this is, why the Sustainable Development Goals are truly groundbreaking and sorely needed, and briefly outline the next steps. First, these goals are a dramatic shift from their predecessor, the Millennium Development Goals. Unlike the MDGs, the SDGs cover the whole range of activities encompassed in sustainable development, which includes the three interconnected dimensions of economic growth, social development, and environmental um, protection. Those of you who, like me, might have grown up with log frames or Ziel-orientierte Projektplanung in their DNA might find that these new goals lack strategic focus and do not provide the same simple, replicable priority setting that the Millennium Development Goals uh, did. Indeed, they do not. By virtue of the participative process that gave rise to these SDGs, however, they are not a strategic plan but a shared vision of humanity in 2030. In my opinion, this is much more powerful. Because of their broad scope, the Sustainable Development Goals are not just conceptually universal, 
but provide concrete avenues for all countries to take ownership and to mobilize to confront today's complex challenges. One, which, one of which is to end the grinding, uh, grinding poverty. Ending poverty irreversibly and reducing risks of future setbacks requires action which are both people and planet centered. And this kind of holistic approach is fostered throughout all of the goals. Reduced risk of environmental catastrophe and strengthening social cohesion are inextricably linked to economic growth and shared prosperity. They are in interdependent, which means they can no longer be pursued in silos. Integrated responses, therefore, are key to ensuring their success. This is why the 2030 Agenda is transformative and why everyone's involvement is so crucial. My colleagues at the UN get nervous when I say this, but in my opinion, sustainable development has been redefined through the 2030 Agenda. We all need to take stock of what it means for us that the reduction of inequalities is now a central pillar for sustainable development, that inclusive societies, access to justice, and good governance have become so central to our common understanding of sustainability. And that we affirm that if any significant social or economic group is left behind, our development is not sustainable. So indeed, there has been a redefinition of this term, sustainable development. In future, we will no longer be able to hide behind averages. This is not just rhetoric. It has important operational implications, which I hope that all the development partners, the Global Partnership on Effective Development Cooperation, and of course the UN will take on board. In future, we will have to bring, begin our strategic planning by identifying who would be left behind. And if you take note of only two sentences tonight, this is the first one, who would be left behind. The second one comes at the end of my speech. We need to ask who are the most vulnerable? What economic, environmental, social, and political threats do they face? How can those threats risk and risks be mitigated? This implies new ways of connecting development and humanitarian action. Ladies and gentlemen, the process that facilitated the historic agreement on the Sustainable Development Goals was inclusive on a historic scale. The United Nations opened its policy-making process in unprecedented ways to an unprecedented range of voices. This established a new benchmark for dialogue and inclusiveness at the UN. As noted by the Secretary General recently, there can be no going back. The next phase of implementation will require the collaboration of all key stakeholders. We will need everyone on deck. It can no longer be so much about who has the mandate to do or to control which part of the implementation process. It must be about enabling and empowering all stakeholders to participate in and contribute to the implementation. A concrete area where this new inclusiveness will have to be visible is the SDG review architecture, i.e. its monitoring and review framework. At the apex or centerpiece of the, of the review process, the high-level political forum will serve as host to the global review process by overseeing a network of review platforms. In doing so, it will be mutually supportive with other intergovernmental thematic platforms, those that are already working to advance the outcomes of international conferences and agreements. Indeed, Many of the SDGs already have dedicated intergovernmental platforms within the UN system. For example, the World Health Assembly reviews commitment and trends related to health and, and the health SDG and targets. The Committee on World Food Security does so for food and nutrition. The COP of the UNFCCC 
looks at climate change, while the, com the Commission on the Status of Women is well positioned to review progress in regard to women's empowerment and gender equality. If these thematic platforms look beyond their natural SDG at important related targets throughout the 169 targets, and if we avoid that any one SDG is controlled or hijacked by one agency or one intergovernmental body, this will strengthen the inter integrative nature of the SDGs. The review architecture itself will have essentially three tiers. First, it will have reviews at the national level, the most significant, the most important. Countries will be encouraged to conduct reviews of progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals involving relevant stakeholders, including civil society, in a transparent way. Second, regional reviews aimed at exchanging experiences and good practice, identifying regional trends and obstacles, commonalities, lessons learned and generating solutions and mutual support. Each region would decide which platform and approach to use. And third, at the global level, here the HLPF, the High Level Political Forum, would culminate the review architecture. It would build on national and regional reviews. Global issues would be identified for goals and or groups of targets along thematic lines without losing the integrated nature of the 2030 Agenda. In this context, it is important to emphasize the state-led and voluntary nature of reviews, as well as the constructive spirit with the principal aim of facilitating exchanges of experience. The UN is not good at policing. And of course, we will need better, timelier, more accessible, and better disaggregated data to inform our policies and review and monitoring progress. Credible data not only empowers communities and serves as an instrument for accountability and transparency, but it also helps to ensure that no one is left behind. This will be challenging for many countries, developed and developing. <laughs> that is why we must work comprehensively to mobilize what we call a data revolution for sustainable development. It will be essential to help build strong national statistical institutions around a broad spectrum of relevant stakeholders. Strengthening statistical capacity is the foundation for monitoring progress of the new 2030 Agenda. A global indicator framework was launched by the UN Statistical Commission and uh, last, last March 2015. And the Commission established an interagency and expert group on sustainable development goals indicators, which is now tasked with developing an indicator framework for the SDGs and targets at the global level. The group consists of representatives of national statistical offices and includes representatives of regional commissions and international agencies. This expert group will propose an ambitious set of indicators for all the SDGs and targets, including means of implementation, and this is to be presented in March 2016 to the Commission, uh, to the Statistical Commission. So, ladies and gentlemen, the challenges before us are enormous, but so are the opportunities. The achievement of the SDGs will require the commitment of all governments and decision makers towards the people and children of this world. That this emerging agenda is not just a new deal among nations, but a solemn promise to its people. The SDGs will not be a quick recipe to deal with the world's greatest challenges, nor a short guide to set global and national priorities. They will be the basis for a new social contract between those who govern and those who are governed, between the duty bearers and the rights holders. And here is the second sentence I want you to remember. The, st the second strategic question we need to ask if we want to implement the SDGs. Not just by the letter, but by the spirit. And that is, are we strengthening the relationship between duty bearers and rights holders? Are we enabling the state, the authorities, 
the service providers to better provide services to the people? And are we enabling the people to better understand what they are right, uh, what they can receive from the state, from the parliamentarians, from the service providers? So these are my two questions. Who is left behind? And are we strengthening the relationship between the state and the people? And if we and if we are able to mainstream these two strategic questions into our organizations, into whether it's the UN, whether it's the INGOs, whether it's uh, uh, the different think tanks, then I think we're starting to take the, the right bend towards implementing the SDGs. Only then will we be able to transform our world and build a safer, more prosperous and sustainable future for all. Thank you again for the opportunity to address you today. Thank you. Thank you for uh, your reflections on the 2030 Agenda on its achievements and what's ahead of us regarding implementation. Uh, right after uh, the summit last week in Berlin, I was um, I attended a, a meeting organized by FEMRO, that's the German umbrella, and you were there also. <laughs> the German de the, um, development NGOs and Friedrich Ebert Foundation on the same topic. And uh, I think many of the points you made were also part of the debate. And uh, Dietrich, you were there too, representing the Ministry of uh, uh, economic Cooperation and Development, and the Ministry of Environment was there too. And the feeling which was um, uh, conveyed by those who had participated in the summit, and I also had the privilege to be there, was, uh, yeah, it was enthusiasm, actually. We, I think, uh, and I was also positively impressed how much enthusiasm uh, could be heard um, in New York, uh, not only by by, by, by these multi-stakeholders, by these uh, different uh, um, groups which participated over the two years in, in uh, analyzing the problems and in analyzing negotiating texts and contributing to a constructive end. Um, now, when we think, I want to concentrate on implementation because I think that um, uh, this will be the, the test the litmus test whether all these two past years were, were worth it and uh, whether they were worth it in the sense that we can um, expand the, the political and the social basis which is committed to implementing the agenda because those who participated in the negotiation are happy because they achieved something. But it's clear that implementation requires to expand the basis quite considerably not only in number, but also over time. We are talking about 15 years, and in these 15 years we will see changes of government. Um, sometimes we will be happy that the government changes, sometimes we will be sad because political constellations can be more favorable or less. But as you said, the multi-stakeholder nature of negotiation and of the implementation process is a, a good heritage, or a good start uh, for, for implementation and process. And I was very happy how the, the summit was staged by the UN because it was really visible that it was not only a platform for heads of state to tell us how they would, how they see the agenda and how they want to implement it, but also to hear from Sally Shetty, for example, from Amnesty International uh, was really inspiring and I think uh, very important. But what is needed for implementation now? I think the basic point you made that several times is we need joint up approaches. So when you say it's the end of silos, I think that's what we hope. That's what the agenda tells us, but this is, has to be shown in practice. And this is valid for um, government departments. This is valid for different departments within research institutions. This is also valid for UN organizations, as you have said, because there are many sectoral UN organizations, um, but it's also, it's not only important for the executive, it's also important for parliament. You didn't mention parliament, or I, I, or I didn't uh, pay attention, but I think parliament is mentioned in the 2030 agenda, and I think that is very important. If we think here in Germany on how we implement uh, our national strategy for sustainable development, it's very much focused on the executive, and the parliament uh, has played 
a rather weak role. And I think if the efforts of the executive to, to really um, engage in joint up approaches and leave the silo approach behind is not mirrored by a joint up approach of committee meetings, by uh, then it, it, um, it won't work so well. Or let's say these two have to reinforce each other. And that also means that Parliament is also a platform where the executive has to show what it's doing, has to show what it's, what it's planning, and where um, uh, societal interest can be fortified and generated through um, public uh, debates and can be brought to um, the local levels also by um, deputies, for example, congressmen. A second thing you mentioned very much is um, what do we need in reporting evaluation? I think, and you mentioned indicators. I would also mention we need qualitative reporting. Many of the changes we want to um, uh, promote with, with this 2030 agenda um, require institutional long-term change. And I, I think that there might be some impact indicators where you can measure an impact but after a certain time, but this should not obfuscate our perspective on the qualitative institutional changes we need to aspire to. So I would say indicators are necessary, but definitely not uh, covering all processes of change we need to be aware of. And it's also this uh, qualitative reporting which will tell us more about the causal relationships, because the indicator does not tell us what actually contributed to the change we, we want we see, or the non-change we see. And I think this is very important because what, why do we do evaluate, uh, re uh, reporting and monitoring to adjust our actions? So I think that uh, adjusting actions is what we expect every so often. In Germany, we have a cycle of uh, so far of four years for the, of adjustment for the National Strategy of Sustainable Development. And um, I think this should be in line with reporting cycles um, at regional and global. Uh, level, but I think adjustment is what we really need to, to think about. And with indicators alone, we won't be able to really understand how we need to adjust action. And this is true not only for, for governments, this is true for all the other stakeholders you mentioned, which uh, should contribute. And therefore, the question is how far, how do these other uh, stakeholders organize their reporting and um, their monitoring? Who will monitor? Uh, the private sector activities, who will monitor um, um, uh, um, what, what entities do which are not directly included in, in national reporting like cities um, or in Germany, the lender, um, or contributions by, by uh, academia or civil society. Then I think another point which, which I think will be uh, needing a lot of reflection and, con and uh, contribution also from the UN organizations is how, how should future cooperation instruments look like? When we talk about um, the 2030 agenda originating new partnerships, um, we, I think we, we, uh, what the uh, agenda does is to, to, um, it has a, a universal approach, so it does mean that we need cooperation instruments for organizing alliances of actors irrespective of whether they are rich countries or poor countries. So um, we need uh, to think how we fund, how we organize these um, partnerships. Um, and so far, we, we have very well established cooperation instruments for North-South cooperation, but do we have that for um, North-North cooperation or for um, cooperation uh, um, uh, partnerships which do not apply to the funding uh, requirements which, which um, dominate our thinking so far uh, for, for traditional reasons very much. So I think we need to think about innovative um, instruments for, for enabling those uh, new forms of cooperation which are required. And this is extremely important also because it's clear that we need to go beyond the niche of those communities which identify most with the 2030 agenda. In Germany, that's development and environment. Uh, I'm part of that community, as was uh, told by Silke. <laughs> but um, uh, you remember, maybe you remember at uh, one of the side events where you also were Carlos Lopez from UNECA, mm -hmm. who said, 
how can we ensure that the universal approach and the normative approach of uh, the 2030 agenda really penetrates communities which are much more far away from this uh, setting. So how do we ensure that trade negotiations uh, follow this concept of, of um, justice, future orientation and fairness? How do we ensure that uh, security and peace in the United Nations Security Council where is the debate? When will the, will the 2030 agenda be on the um, uh, be discussed by the uh, UN Security Council? Um, I think in the climate negotiations we are much closer to it, but uh, for sure there is also room for improvement. Um, you said the reality is fragmented, and that could be felt very clearly. Um, I think on Saturday or Sunday. I opened BBC World Service to see what happens outside this community where I'm now. And I think it was um, Holland had just sent the jets in um, over Syria to drop the bombs. Yeah. So that's quite a contrast. And, um, and we also know that Syria was on the agenda of the normal General Assembly after the summit. So I think to, to um, close the gap between business as usual in the UN by governments and what's what we aspire to with the 2030 agenda, that will be the requirement we have to implementation process and to accountability processes related to it. So thank you. Input, which is very stimulating, I think, from you, Thomas. We heard an appreciation of what's um, new and what's also so so valuable about the 2030 agenda. And you did a very good job in highlighting the opportunities which lie ahead, not ne neglecting the challenges, but also saying this is something we can now take hold of and use. And you gave us two guiding questions for the implementation. Emma, on the other hand. Um, did a very good job in raising awareness for sort of the pressing issues in the implementation phase, like uh, how do we break out, or how do we win over other constituencies, how could an integrated approach really work? And I think uh, with that, I would actually like to open the floor to um, the audience, because I think many of you follow the debates and have questions to ask to the, to the panelists. So please raise your hand. And I would like to collect a couple of questions and then um, let also Thomas react to, to him in a few months. I see the lady in the back on the right. Thank you, Dr. Mutsunitti. I'm Samuel Schmidt from UNIT International. We are doing adult education right from the morning all over the world. This morning, we had a group of our colleagues from Afghanistan with us to discuss uh, association, work, progress. And well, you can imagine, they told us about the situation of the Adult Education Center in Kunduz, and of the colleagues and the devs and the, how they follow up. And we are all discussing right now with all our offices how we can manage the pressure under normal circumstances and even under federal circumstances of our colleagues and partners all over the world to monitor as part of civil society the agenda 2030 and following what they told us this morning here in Boyle, we are really just like quite stressed about civil society's um, role you design because we don't see any supportive structure, any um, financial ideas, any capacity from our partners. We really miss this uh, link to them. Thank you. Thank you very much. I saw Mr. Dietrich in the front row who would also like to ask a question. Yeah, thank you very much. A question and a remark. Um, um, I, I was listening very, very close to your remarks on implementation. Thomas Kass and Anna Schultz, uh, you mentioned leave no one behind as one of the main sentences, yes. 
um, in the Scholz Parliament um, um, also um, uh, the, the qualitative uh, aspect of, of, of monitoring and, and review. I agree completely. What we should pay attention, in my view, is to, to really have a an, an universal uh, a discussion and a discussion on a universal agenda to not uh, fall in the trap to just discuss um, down them in the south and discuss like uh, the energies were uh, for the countries of the south. Uh, I think when we talk on implementation, we also have to talk on how to implement the agenda here in Germany. And for that reason, we always try to structure implementation in three columns. Implementation in Germany, we have our uh, German national strategy on sustainable development. We have the future of the, uh, the charter of the future. You mentioned it. Uh, it's not working well. Um, <coughs> not the charter, but the microphone. Can you Yeah. Okay. You. Um, uh, this is very important. This chart of the future for, to 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 make the parts the actors of society. To, to create ownership, to, to participate in the implementation, and, and uh, not just to, to create ownership, but also to get them in the implementation. We can't, as government, uh, implement an agenda. We need all parts of society, all, all parts, all actors. Uh, but we also have to think on, on what we should do, and you mentioned that, Emil Scholz, what uh, the system, the development system has to do. Uh, to, and we are exactly for that reason um, having a sort of streamlining, sort of um, mainstream our whole portfolio and to assure that all uh, parts of implementation, all parts of our portfolio are um, have a sort of a check. Uh, we want to make BMZ fit for the agenda and we also would like to have or we also will have a sort of a initiative program to, <coughs> to, to support that countries and their challenges to implement the agenda in their national policies. I will stop here uh, and I just uh, would like to ask uh, to focus more also on the national level here in Germany. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much and I see a last um, question of the gentleman in the back and then the two of you will have the opportunity to reply. Yes, uh, thank you. Just one brief question regarding the um, implementations as a consequence of the um, representatives who negotiate. Now, during the discussions of the millennium votes, there has been in the aftermath uh, mentioned time and again that uh, such uh, enormous uh, consultations, multilateral, um, high-level consultations, would be questionable. So the question to you, to both, is to which degree would uh, the current uh, SDGs negotiations also reflect um, this previous uh, discussion. So, uh, in the end, would you consider that the output, the possibilities of the agenda items to be implemented, uh, to be better off than they were with the Millennium Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, please, Thomas, you have uh, three challenging sets of questions. Thank you very much, and I'm glad that uh, the the example of, of Afghanistan came at the beginning because it because that's the reality of our world, and it's going to be the reality of the next 15 years. It's not going to be a, an easy sailing. There are going to be challenges. We had challenges over the last 15 years. Remember, we had 9/11, we had wars, we had economic crisis, we had food crisis. I mean, and, and and there's no real reason the next 15 years would be any easier. Um, that said, it's the first time that we, as a as a global community, we come together and put the finger on some of the root causes. And I think that that is very significant. That we that actually you have a you know 193 countries coming together and saying the the big problem is the rise of inequality. I mean, that's huge. The big problem is that there are people who are left behind. Of course, and, 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 the, the, and that there is no coherence in our policies. Now, of course, that, 
puts then the responsibility back to the national level. And uh, as, as Mr. Dietrich rightly said, we have to then at the national level see, okay, what does that mean? But I'm, I mean, I, I, as, as was said previously, I served in, in Nepal, and, and I must say <laughs> that, the, that the way the, the, the SDGs address some of these root causes gives me a lot of courage and a lot of food for thought in terms of, uh, of changing the way we do business in, uh, in, in development cooperation. Uh, it's not going to solve everything, and I think that one of the biggest challenges moving forward will be the one of policy coherence. And I think that that was also what uh, Emma Schultz mentioned. I mean, when you said, when you said that uh, you know, the Security Council met on Monday, you know, just after, on Sunday after the celebrations were finished, you know, on, on, on Monday the Security Council met in the kind of traditional way with the kind of same members, etc. That's true. At the same time there was, uh, during the last six months, there was a high-level panel on peace building led by Ambassador Rosenthal, who did that panel did take on board very strongly the messages of this of this new agenda, and that's very um, that's very encouraging. The the uh, the other process that stands right before us, and some of you may represent that community, is the humanitarian the humanitarian action. That's so the the the, the ball I would say is in your camp now, uh, and it's really important that the humanitarian community now doesn't go off and says, okay, the SDGs didn't mention any IDPs and therefore we need to establish our own humanitarian goals. I mean, if, if leaving no one behind and, and this strong emphasis on building resilience doesn't create a bridge between the development and the humanitarian action, then I, then I think uh, we are really in a bad place. So we need to build that bridge. We need to make sure that we learn out, out of, the, of that action. So this is another space where coherence has to be built. And then, um, um, just to come back more specifically to the points raised by, by Mr. Dietrich, I really welcome that, uh, that Germany has already volunteered to, to be one of the first to present, uh, to present its national review at a global level. But as you, I think, implied, the most important is the actual national review. It's not the presentation that you will do of it in the UN, but how much of a national dialogue can happen at a national, uh, uh, in Germany and in every country. And the quality of these dialogues will determine very much to what extent uh, that, that social breadth and that time, uh, uh, that the sustainability of the subject itself can be secured, as uh, uh, Mrs. Scholz already mentioned. We have to adapt our own organizations and make them fit for purpose, and that's why I mentioned these two points. To me, they are very, very concrete. You know, are we check to, to check whether we are leaving anyone behind? That means to, to instead of going for the low-hanging fruit and, and for the maximum leverage as normally we would have done in development cooperation to actually start by identifying the most vulnerable groups. That will be a change in paradigm. And the other one, uh, asking ourselves whether our action actually strengthens the relationship between duty bearers and rights holders, believe me, that is not the way we usually do the business. And, and that also applies to philanthropics and to INGOs and NGOs. So to come to your last question, um, Sir, I do think that if we apply these kind of lessons, then we definitely have moved from the Millennium Development Goals to the, to the SDGs. And it's not going to be about big conferences going forward, it's going to be about the quality of the dialogue and of the review processes at the national level. Yeah, let me add something to national implementation in Germany. That's what I normally talk about, um, because that's what, what we are discussing since uh, three years in, in the German Council for Sustainable Development, which um, was in, instituted in 2002 when Germany adopted its own national strategy for sustainable development that was in the context after Rio 92 and 
uh, and uh, with a view to the uh, summit in Johannesburg in 2002. And what we realized in the council is that the 2030 agenda and the SDGs uh, really were a very, very good uh, or a unique opportunity actually to make the German strategy to update it and to make it more relevant uh, for, for change, to contribute for transformative uh, processes. To strengthen its, uh, the international dimension of it, because the agenda was, the strategy was very much inward looking and was weak on, the, on its international dimension. And so I think that um, we have a, a very good opportunity of, of creating, uh, or let's say the executive has a very good opportunity of creating a better strategy and a better document and to make it uh, clear that the German strategy mirrors the 17 goals and its um, uh, targets. Uh, for this to happen, um, the, the German government for the first time organizes a series of public consultations. And I think that is already an, uh, uh, a consequence of the open working group process and the strong participation which was um, also from the German side in, in that process. So. Formally, the updates of the German strategy were just done by uh, the executive, and now it is uh, open to public uh, uh, debate. Um, to start on the 29th of October in, in Berlin with um, Altmaier, the, yeah, from the Kanzler. Um, but I think that uh, we really need to, to use the, the 12 months until the German presentation in, in, in New York for um, maintaining, for expanding interest across communities uh, in Germany. Uh, last week there was a, a congress um, organized by the private sector on private sector and ethics, Wirtschaftsethik Congress. For many of us, that combination sounds even sometimes paradox if we just think of um, how we, for example. But, um, and that was debated in New York. It was really uh, not very helpful. <laughs> but the, the, the positive message which came from this uh, Congress were, um, was that um, there were many speakers from the private sector who said the 2030 agenda is an opportunity. So um, the, the, uh, it, was, it happened at the headquarters of Commerzbank and the head of the um, Supervisory Board in Aufsichtsrat of the Commerzbank publicly spoke very much in favor of the 2030 agenda. And I think we should take this as a positive statement and not as an indication of, of the interest of the sector to, to invest in greenwashing. I think we have to be open for, for real uh, contributions in that uh, sense too. Regarding civil society organizations, I remember that was a topic at, at one of at the accountability side event where we both were. were um, uh, attention was was uh, drawn to to the shrinking space, the shrinking sp uh, policy space for NGOs and civil society organizations in many uh, countries, especially with a view to international support NGOs are receiving, and and I think this is a real challenge for us. I mean, Germany, uh, the BMZ um, invests a lot of money in strengthening NGOs and CSOs uh, abroad, and I think that is very important because other donors have reduced their funding considerably. But still, um, it's, it will be necessary to think how that can be done in a way that it does not generate suspicion, but that, that it really strengthens civil, uh, what you said, the relationship between uh, right holders and duty bearers um, in, a, in a constructive way. But I think that this will also require different political approaches by, by the, how did you call them? The duty bearers. Yeah. Thank you very much for the two of you to, for taking up the questions. I now have the lady in the second row in green who would like to ask a question and actually two gentlemen next to her, wonderful. So we have the next set of three questions over there. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. okay. My name is Bettina Hedendunkos. I'm from the German Federal Agency for Nature Conservation. And I'm glad that Kimmer already mentioned uh, the keyword strategy, because I was almost wondering um, whether a, a strategy or a roadmap uh, for achieving the goals, which is essential in implementation, 
was part of the negotiation process? Was it discussed at a certain stage that we, an, a, a, a strategy is necessary, that countries might need guidelines, especially since we have uh, goals here that are interlinked, as we said earlier? Thank you. Um, good evening. I'm Sushil Kumar, MDG participant in DIE. My question is regarding review progress. As you mentioned, this is the structure of national, regional, and global. And uh, I'm thinking about a national level, a lot of uh, uh, some developed area, some uh, LDC area. So why not we make a local or district level, then national level, then regional, and then global level? Because if we have information from the local and district level, policy maker, think tank, uh, academics will make a good policy about debate about the <coughs> implementation of the uh, uh, STD goal. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for the inspiring talks and also um, to keep the momentum this this platform and that um, is provided here after the, the summit, I think is key um, for the implementation and to take it forward. So uh, building on that and, and what was talked about institutional change and what do you think is key uh, for reaching the institutional change we desire to meeting the, the SDGs and implementing the SDGs uh, in a sense of um, what mechanisms and platforms are needed um, for example to uh, reach institutional change and actually get constructive laws um, e.g. Um, limits to CO2 emissions by cars for example and not only the voluntary um, basis uh, that the MDGs had, the SDGs um, suggest but they're going beyond so what what are mechanisms and and uh, frameworks that are needed for this institutional change we want. Thank you very much. Three very good questions. One on sort of don't countries now need guidelines or, or some support for the strategy and was that actually part of the negotiations? What about the local level in, uh, in the review of the mechanism? And uh, how do we create the institutional setup to, to, to come to a transformative change? Thomas, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's a very important question. I would say that about a year ago, and, and during the last two years, this issue of what do we need, do we need a strategy or do we need something else, was a key question. And I would say it was a question that, was, that particularly divided those who were for the universality of the agenda versus those who wanted something MDG+. plus. You know, and, and so wanted something really focused, and that's why I said those, you know, those, jokingly, of course, those who have log frames in their DNA, you know. Of course, we need strategic plans in the future to, to develop this, but the, the universality, the, the, I think the quality of the participation of all the stakeholders uh, just produced something else than a strategic plan. You see, uh, to have a strategic plan, you have a small group, and then you kind of roll it out. It presumes that some people know better than others what the others need. Here, the, there is a very strong sense that there is an agreement on where we want to reach, but that every country and every organization will have to see how it gets there and how it contributes to, to reaching there. Now, I know that that is not always satisfactory, and that in some countries that will lead to maybe inefficiencies, but this is the way I think the next 15 years the, 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 the stakeholders want to take it. So the discussions about what the strategies are going to be are really, really important, but they have to be at the national level, like Mr. Dietrich has, has been saying. And, and I would argue those of us who are involved in other countries, we better make sure that the discussion happens between the duty bearers and the rights holders there, and not that we second guess you know what the people really need because that is also a risk of development cooperation is that in we kind of uh, hijack the the development discourse and it becomes uh, the dialogue between us as 
as uh, development partners and the uh, and the pro and the government. And I'm glad that uh, Mr. Kumar that you then went on to point out to the importance of the sub-national level dialogues. We had earlier this afternoon, we had uh, several discussions here within the Institute, and one of the discussions was, you know, why, what is this thing about global goals versus sustainable development goals, and how much can you really simplify this message? And my take on that is that if this is a social contract, between between the leaders and the people, we better get to know the small script. And the small script are the 169 targets. And we need to know where, where are the significant targets that are relevant at every level, and particularly at the sub-national level. What will make this agenda stick in the end is not so much whether people remember the 17 goals. What will make this agenda stick is that uh, the people who don't have a, a water and sanitation know that there is a promise there by their leaders that they will get within the next 15 years water and sanitation. That those people who don't have a legal identity you know, n know that there is a promise, there is a target there that by 2030 everyone will have a legal identity. That there is a promise there that uh, single-headed households will receive uh, support uh, social support because of the, the, the impossibility of being able to deal with all, all the, the challenges. I mean, it's the coming together of all these aspirations, of all these expectations that, in my opinion, will lend strength to this agenda. And the only way to do that is via the local level and via the parliaments. I'm glad you, you called me up on that. I mean, I did, I did mention the parliaments in passing, but not enough. Parliaments play a key role, and we did have um, we did have in early September a meeting of the presidents of Parliament in, in New York, where they discussed specifically the SDGs and also discussed uh, examples of committees that had been established. Uh, for example, I know I remember in Fiji they are establishing a sustainable development committee that would be chaired by the speaker and to which all the ministers would have to come and uh, and suggest indicators how their ministries their line ministries could be uh, monitored in terms of the implementation of the SDGs so this this is a uh, just one one more example um, because in the end and then I come to the third question in the end it will be about policies and laws but these policies and laws have to be developed at the national level. There's not so much that can be done at the global level, except make sure that this debate is constantly upheld and is continued, um, and that those actors who are international are constantly included in that discussion, including the private sector. Of course, there, there, and, and there the global compact, for example, is going to play a role, but also other other ways of engaging the private sector. Thank you very much. Fatima, would you like to, to add something on this? Yeah. I think your question, how to reach institutional change, what the, what the 2030 agenda tells us is that the national level is very much in the need for that. Yeah. So that means that institutional change will occur when important actors at the national level, and that includes the electorate, yeah, realize that they have something to gain from that. That's why, why you mentioned, I think, the, the promises um, of, of the agenda. But I also think it um, uh, um, implementation process needs to um, indicate um, where bottlenecks are. That's the, that's the, the, the function of the review uh, process, to identify bottlenecks. And I think that this is a challenge very much also for um, countries like Germany, because we are very much used to show where we are doing well. We don't like to point out our own bottlenecks. If you look at the reporting system on the, on the National Strategy for Sustainable Development, bottlenecks have really not been in the forefront. Um, and I think that is something where, where you need active uh, societal um, participation for that. But I also think that um, 
the, it is very important to to um, to link the the agenda with specific improvements. Yeah. So not to talk about it in abstract terms, but to say what is it precisely uh, um, we want to have to achieve in the in the first five years of implementation, in which areas. And then to, to see where are we do, making progress and where are we lagging behind and what is the reason behind that. Because, and then and also in the beginning of, of the implementation to assign joint responsibility for implementation to goals. So as you said, uh, Thomas, to avoid that specific that um, um, ministries distribute the goals between them so that they don't disturb each other. Yeah. So it, what they need to do is disturbing each other. That's exactly this type of irritation is what we, what we need, and we know the main irritation points, and it's no, that's no secret. Yeah, but it needs to be seen not as a, something to avoid, but to take up, and I think that's um, that's the opportunity uh, um, we we have now, um, because then the irritation will be that the bottlenecks persist and not um, that. So the irritation will be will, will go away when, when when ministries and and other actors learn to constructively cooperate and not to um, maneuver each other out of the game. Can I just add one more point? Thanks. Sure. I, I also want to add on that, but if you want to go ahead. Just just one more point there to to react. Uh, in these national dialogues, when you discuss the bottlenecks, you also have to discuss the means of implementation. What does it take? And, and let me just take two examples. One is policy coherence. That's something that, of course, can be discussed. I mean, in the, at the global level, we can point to the, to the, the, the inconsistency of policy coherence. Like we can say, you know, how can you say, on the one hand, you want developing countries to be stronger in the, in the way they manage their fiscal revenue, their, 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 their taxes, etc. And on the other hand, refuse that within the UN they have a stronger space to discuss taxes. I mean, that, we can say that, but then it's at the national level that you have to push your own policymakers to, to, to change that. The other one is, for example, on, on, uh, since since we, we had a question from, from the natural sciences, maybe I can go back to my own background. I mean, we have, we have climate change that is going to come, and we need our crop systems, our agricultural systems to be adapting to that. We are not ready for it. Mm -hmm. we, we are not ready to adapt. Our crop systems are not yet resilient. Why? Because the actual resilience is not going to be found in some technical or technological miracle. It is the, the diversity, the genetic diversity that is within the plants and within the nature that needs to be brought to bear. Now the only way to do that is to invest into public research and breeding and, and, and widening the gene pools of those food crops. And that requires public funding. And so it's not something that's there. It's something that countries that are richer need to do. Otherwise, our, we, our food production over the next uh, 15 years is not going to be able to hold with the increase in the population. Thank you, Thomas. Emma, I wanted to add on sort of your, your, your plea to say uh, how, that we need to um, to prevent that certain goals become hijacked by institutions like ministries or like UN organizations or like the World Bank. And my question to both of you for the next round then would also be, who needs to take action now and what kind of action can that be? How can we make that more specific? Because I think that's one of the biggest dangers we're facing right now when, when we look, um, I and mean, we talked about this earlier, already multilateral organizations are trying to obtain mandates for certain goals, right? Yeah. Already, um, some ministries try to present themselves as the ministry for the SDG agenda. So what actually needs to be done and who can do it? And, um, but we have two other people who would like to also um, ask a question or do a comment. Stefan Griffith Jones behind yeah, there and Matthias Böning and the so uh, right to it. Thank you very much for a very inspiring presentation and for starting with such a uh, 
positive uh, evaluation of the zone. So to decide where they were to achieve their working. I have two questions related maybe most to uh, what you say. Can you hold the microphone closer to your oh, oh, sorry. Oh, no. I Is that better? Yes. yes. Yeah. Right. I'm sorry. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one uh, relates to what new instruments, a little bit Thomas was already talking about, it, including at the national level, will be designed or have been discussed in terms of facilitating the implementation of these sustainable development goals. I mean, in the field that I work, for example, um, can new instruments in both in the private and the public financial sector be designed? For example, invest more in, 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 in renewable energy and in other aspects, or what instruments are required to improve income distribution. Because if we don't have the specific instrument, and the government has been on the whole reducing the instruments they have, then we, the governments don't have the means to, to help fulfill these problems. And my second question relates to the important point that um, Ima also raised about monitoring, in the sense that uh, how will, for example, the contribution of the private sector be effectively monitored? Mm -hmm. And how can we incorporate realistically the private sector in the, in the delivery of, of these goals, sustainable development, the greater equality, in, in ways that are realistically consistent uh, with um, their main aim, which is to make short-term profits, and also what are the limits of these contributions. We should perhaps uh, realize how much can be achieved, and those things that cannot be achieved, um, what other actors can step in. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Matthias, please. Thank you, Matthias Böning. I work for DG, which is the German Development Finance Institution. Um, my uh, question points into a similar direction. I found it quite, a, uh, quite interesting that you said, how can we avoid that uh, some goals will be hijacked by uh, some actors? I would turn around and say, uh, with regard to goal eight, maybe, how can we uh, make sure that uh, the most important actors are not left behind, if we want to <laughs> uh, uh, say it in the same language. Um, because we see very high expectations uh, uh, for the private sector, we saw them in Addis, we saw them in New York, and um, it is uh, good uh, on an on a, on a actor level to have um, the global partnership now reach out to a broader set of actors, but um, my question um, really, first of all, is very technical. How uh, will, for example, the, the major groups, also the business major group, uh, be part of the uh, monitoring and review architecture? And um, how, what instruments do we have to really um, make the private sector part of this architecture now? And um, the second question would also be, um, at the moment, we. Uh, we just talked about when we came here, um, I deal a lot with the uh, OEC DAC uh, um, and, and all the new instruments for private sector mobilization that are uh, um, debated in this uh, forum. On the other hand, it is the rich countries club. And so <laughs> uh, from a multilateral uh, view, how can we make sure that the discussion is also um, put on the multilateral level and uh, goes beyond the Rich Countries Cup and, uh, and the DAC. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's enough uh, for another round of replies. Thomas, would you like to do an answer? Just tell me. Do you want to start? Me? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so how to avoid hijacking. I think first we have to be clear what we mean by that. Yeah. So when I interpret you now, Thomas, but I think that we are on the same page there, that hijacking would mean to to bring implementation back into silos, yeah, and to avoid uh, um, uh, uh, understanding the logics of other uh, uh, policy actors which are included, like saying sustainable food production is something the agricultural ministry does, and we don't need the environment ministry there, yeah, that would be hijacking. So, um, and in that sense, I would say. Of course, the World Bank has to be engaged in that, but you have the silos within the World Bank, yeah? So if the World Bank wants to contribute, they have to avoid to assign single goals to single departments within the World Bank, yeah? And um, uh, so 
that's why I think from the when you think about implementation plans, this uh, joint responsibility has to be put on the page first. Yeah. So if the the, the federal government in Germany says goal, um, which is the one on food too, not to hunger, is something which needs to be dealt with by Ministry of Environment, Ministry of Agriculture, and Ministry of Development, then other institutions need to at least mirror that combination. Yeah, um, and I think that that. The, the implementation plans designed by government will have a strong signaling um, effect. And if the government fails on that, then it will be very difficult to, to leave these usual confrontations like the government is not doing it right and the NGOs are criticizing all that and then will, will not work. Now, I also think that other sectors of society have to face it too. I, I, I talked a lot to NGOs on that and they said, and I for example, the development NGOs are told me, you can't discuss the 2030 agenda by yourself. You need to find broader platforms, and not only the environmental NGOs. Yeah. So um, how do you link up with the, the poverty organizations, the social welfare organizations, the Deutsche Paritätische Wohlfahrtsverband? Yeah? These are unusual gatherings. Um, uh, and, and I think there are everyone here can think of what it would mean for your own uh, community and your own sector, what it means. Um, but I think the signaling effect of, of the, in, in Germany, the, the Nationale Nachhaltigkeitsstrategie will be, will be uh, important. And now, and I think in the same way, um, the, the, um, this, the, the German strategy could needs to signal, we, 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 you know, as a Council for Sustainable Germ uh, Development in Germany, we, we published a, a statement at the end of May. We had been asked by the Chancellor to, to give advice how to integrate the SDGs in the new um, uh, German strategy. And we proposed many things. You can find it on the internet in, in German and in English. And one thing we proposed was to create platforms for these non-state contributions. Now, I think for the private sector that won't be easy because it will require to leave the to leave the cozy part of it and to, to really move forward and say this is what we want to achieve in the next by 2030. They would also have to put forward their own uh, sector-wide, for example. I mean, we know this sector-wide debates from the climate policy uh, um, discussions why not have sector-wide commitments to reduce CO2 emissions? This could be one thing, yeah? So um, so it's it's really asking stakeholders to think about what can I contribute by myself and where do I need specific support from policy or financial support? Mm -hmm. But I think the private sector is really, um, needs to take a proactive action there. And of course it will be monitored and reviewed by others, and they will judge, is this ambitious enough? Uh, that's uncomfortable to do. Yeah, But I think um, that if, if the government um, includes this idea of platforms for um, contributions of non-state actors, then it pushes the ball over to the other field. Yeah? Um, and of course it will still be voluntary, but it it, it will be included, I think it must be included, in the, in the reporting and reviewing system. Now, of course, that requires a lot of um, conversations uh, before. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know whether they are engaged in such conversations. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to just add, I mean, I agree with the points that were made. Um, sometimes, when I feel really provocative, I start my speeches by by referring to the article in The Economist in March. It was a, there was an article that said that the SDGs are stupid because it would take 4% of global GDP to implement 169 targets. And I like that, to start with that, because actually this agenda is not about 4%. And uh, one of the goals, goal 13, is about climate change. How can you imagine? 
getting child climate change under control with leveraging just 4% of GDP. So it's clear this agenda is about 100%. And so we need to make sure that we have everyone on board. And we need to change the discussion. And we are, especially those of us who work in bureaucracies, we like this idea of who is allowed to do what and who has the mandate to do what. We have to change that logic. In, in the future, it has to be about who is, who is a, who enables a, a maximum of partners to participate? Who empowers a maximum of partners to participate? That's what it's going to be. It's, that's what it's going to take to move from 4% to 100%. And, and that's complicated. It means we have to look at our administrations and our bureaucracies differently. And it can't be about who has the mandate. Of course, we have, we have uh, mandates, but the mandate is not an exclusive, can no longer be an exclusive one. And that's where we have to be careful. And that's what I meant by hijacking, is the idea that, for example, if we stay with goal number two on food and nutrition, that FAO says, oh, goal two is our goal, you know, stay away. If we go that, we go down from 4% to 1%. Huh? If we say, if the Committee on World Food Security says this is the same problem. And, and I, I really would like to emphasize these intergovernmental platforms. At a global level, they are really important. I like to call them the docking stations for the review of the system. We need to make sure that these different intergovernmental platforms, and the most obvious one is the COP on climate change. They need to be they need to be energized by this 2030 agenda. Whether it's the, the COP, whether it's the CBD, whether it's the commission, commission on the Status of Women, the Commission on Population and Development, there's about 30 to 40 of these intergovernmental platforms. Some, most of them are UN, some of them are kind of on the side of the UN, the, the Global Partnership of an Effective Development Cooperation, the, the and the forum on the migration and development that's happening next year in Istanbul. These, and these platforms need to be energized, but also they need to scan the 169 targets and see, okay, which ones are the targets that we can contribute to? And then the next step, and that is really critical, they need to ask themselves, do we have the right stakeholders on board to be able to review and contribute to the implementation of these targets that we've identified. And then, if you, if you ask, if these platforms, these bodies, honestly ask themselves this question, they cannot leave the private sector on. The private sector is going to play a crucial role. Now, the problem is, I think, when we deal with the private sector, there is a, there is a subject that is taboo. And you, may, you actually refer to it in the, in the other way. You said, you said the private sector, its objective is to make short-term profits. I believe that there needs to be a discussion, and in some of the more progressive uh, companies, there is already a discussion, including within the boards, including with their shareholders, about what it means. You know, this, this dilemma of sustainability versus short-term profits. And, and I, I'm one that strongly believes that we need to start giving a premium to companies who have, who have the courage and the, 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 the ethics, let's say, to come back to the point, to stay in situations, in production situations, even if the production costs start to rise because of increasing wages or because they are paying taxes. You know, I mean, these are the ways that the private sector is going to contribute to a more sustainable world, let's face it. It's going to be by absorbing higher wages and by participating in the cost of in, in, in financing global public goods. And, and the, the progressive modern companies that, that are actually going through these discussions are realizing that they have everything to gain from a more sustainable development, from a more predictable environment, from larger middle classes and, and a reduction of inequalities in their countries. And, that means the, the tar there is a target there about uh, decent jobs for women and men. And it's not just about creating a job here and then in a couple of years moving away to another country. 
it's also sustaining that to a certain extent. Of course, there comes a point where a company leaves. But right now, there is still the sense that it's good business and good business strategy to leave, you know, when your when your, your, your profits are, are no longer uh, doing so well. And I think that that goes counter to, to, to some of this uh, spirit that the private sector helped to develop this agenda. Um, one more point on the OECD DAC, because that, that came. So what can the OECD DAC, uh, do? I think it was your, your point, what can they do? I think that at the end of the Addis conference, there was a little bit of an, of, a, of an instinctive reflex reaction by the OECD countries to say, oh no, we don't want the, U, the, the tax debates, the debt debates, the discussions about the definition of of ODA, etc. We don't want those in the UN. We want to keep those in in Paris and in Geneva. I think that that now that they see that this is an agenda that is really good to move forward, I I hope that the OECD countries will look over these decisions again and and start shifting some of these debates into an area where the playing field and also trade is another of these areas. In the, into an area where the playing field is more even, so that we can have policy coherence in those areas also. Yeah, I also wanted to answer, um, contribute to answering your questions, but I, th I don't think they have easy answers, right? Um, I read in a report um, that the Ruins Recupero from WTO said at the summit, we need to reform uh, the WTO to make it uh, compatible with the 2030 agenda. I think it's, it shows how things have changed. <laughs> he has to battle now to make his, his organization relevant again if, against uh, TPP, TTIP, and, and, and these regional blocks. So I think that is a good uh, opportunity. At another side event, uh, Achim Steiner from UNEP also said, um, we can't expect markets to deliver the kind of social choices which are expressed in the 2030 agenda. Markets as they function now won't deliver that. So we, are talk we need to talk about regulating markets. And, um, and of course, this, the, the reaction to such a statement in different countries is quite different. Yeah. Um, uh, but so he talked about detaxing labor, taxing resource use, taxing non-recycling, uh, taxing pollution. That would be a clear incentive for private sector to do, to, to do certain investments, right? Um, and it would uh, support those uh, uh, companies who have discovered that already and who are competing in a non-level playing field with others, other companies who simply call, go on externalizing their costs and not paying for it. Uh, and, and who pays for that? The taxpayer, or if nothing is done, it is the citizen who is, who is suffering under the consequences and the future generations. So I think that um, uh, policies and regulations definitely are part of the of the implementation, and and that shows um, that in, in some areas the, the, the avenue might be quite steep. But I think that um, this is this is what what is needed. Um, and I think that um, a redesign of, of tax systems obviously would also have a, an impact on income uh, on distribution, uh, for sure. Um, in this uh, side event where Achim Steiner talked, um, that was organized by the Environment Ministry of, of Germany and together with uh, um, South Africa and uh, Norway. And the Norwegian environment minister said very clearly, we need to, to restructure our economy to reduce our dependence on oil and gas. This message was driven very strongly home to the Norwegians because of the falling prices for oil and, and uh, uh, yeah. But still, Norway has enough resources for accompanying this restructuring process with social investment programs. This is obviously very different in, in other uh, contexts. But it was interesting to hear from the South African environment minister that she said, 
We have a national development plan, and in Chapter 7, which is about economic development, uh, it has been the, the need to, to, to um, make economic development green was very strongly mainstream in that chapter. So I think that is, that is an achievement from a major developing country which has many, many bottlenecks to face um, to, to have achieved that. Now, of course, to have it in a document is different from having it in actual policy implementation. But still, to have a national document which does that is, uh, uh, is worth a lot, I think. Thank you very much for to the two of you. Now we have the last round of questions unless someone uh, really urgently needs to say something. Okay, which is going to consist of five questions, I'm sorry to say. So the first one is the lady, uh, sorry, the gentleman in the um, second row. Then we have the um, gentleman in the back, um, the one over there, and I saw the two other people on the right hand side. So please do start. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentations. Uh, my name is Manuel Davy from the International Renewable Energy Agency. Uh, I really like the point you made about the four versus the 100%. Uh, because 100%, politically speaking, is relatively easy consensus to build. And so we have 160 plus targets, and not all of them are 100%. And so my question is really about implementation. Uh, how do you expect to find a sweet spot in the implementation of the known 100%, known universal targets? When it remains very vague, of course, the political consensus is already being put on paper. When it comes to giving to a statistical commission the role of determining indicators and targets, I would expect that not to be a statistical exercise, but more a political exercise where consensus has to be reached. So, how do you envision the process moving forward in determining this uh, non-universal, non-100% uh, targets and to build a political consensus, not just statistical work uh, around those? Thank you very much. Yes, a brief follow-up. Considering both the global and the national perspective, which uh, emphasize in terms of also subsidiarity and decision-making, and of course, in terms of such a therapy, uh, considering the implementation, would you attribute to, to the role of regional organizations in the terms of uh, chapter chapter eight? Would it be uh, in the African Union or ASEAN or ASEAN? Thank you. My name is Stefan Thurisson. Allow me to have a little bit different perspective because I worked 30 years in the private sector packaging industry for food products. And I mean, I think the, this part, the packaging industry, I think, they are a little bit further away. So my last company has a slogan, Deutschbach goes green. And they had the idea that for every machine they deliver, they let calculate by a third party how many CO um, produce as a production and how many CO do the production the customer side and then the owner of the company plan for each volume and a number of trees. So when then the customer gets a certificate, we plan so many trees for it. And they like it. And there are craft foods or other companies who get the certificates and it's an easy example. So the point is for me more that you need to bring ideas to the companies, and this is a communication problem. If you have more than 100 goals, the owner of the company gets crazy, and I think the NGOs need to sell their products, and maybe these are ideas, and they need to go to the companies. And then I think it will work, because the owner is a man or a woman, and they also like the planet. Harry Tan, Harry from China, and now a member of MGG uh, 13. Thank you very much, Ms. Thomas, for your excellent presentation and also the one of the comments from Emma Susan. Uh, my question is that according to the media report, uh, during the session of the last month's UN assembly, some developing countries such as Brazil, 
China to Russia or the Korea to Russia. Uh, Proclaim the some uh, new plans uh, for in the area of uh, climate change adaptations. So my question is that, would you please give some more uh, details of the assembly, especially the discussion and the negotiations, uh, the attitude and uh, uh, of the different economic development levels of uh, the different development levels countries, especially if there are some uh, new preeminent plans uh, of the main developing countries. Thank you. I think there was a last question also on that side. Oh, sorry, the gentleman over there. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, my name is Johannes Schneider, I was being upset. Uh, having served in some of uh, the urban countries, uh, I'm a big supporter of uh, the country driven approach, and uh, I uh, agree that it must be, this process must be uh, country driven, country owned. But also, uh, I'm a little bit skeptical uh, because the policy makers in these countries are often uh, more uh, short term looking, uh, looking at their electing period, but uh, and uh, some of them uh, would like to uh, will, uh, fill up their pockets, uh, uh, but uh, they are not so much uh, into the thinking of the uh, common people. But, uh, and, and uh, that's my question. What, 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 what other, uh, probably, obviously, this, uh, this uh, SDGs are not, uh, uh, they are on a voluntary basis, uh, there are no, no sanctions, but uh, do you expect any, 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 any uh, uh, um, well, re uh, reactions from the donor side as well, from the, so from the developed uh, countries? if they uh, see that some uh, countries do not follow this approach or are not following well the, or are not achieving the milestones or, or what else and the second question i have since it's 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 a uh, uh, it's a country driven approach uh, is there a system uh, regional wise that they uh, exchange their lessons learned uh, and uh, because you, you mentioned Thomas is uh, the Fiji example, but I think other countries may uh, would like to take up some of these uh, successes, and uh, I think there must be a system of exchange of uh, these kind of uh, experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now abuse my uh, privileges as moderator and add another question, which needs to be uh, asked because we're in the lecture series. United Nations at 75th for the future. We want Thomas. Um, where do you see the role of the UN system in implementing? What kind of changes or challenges does the universality of the agenda bring? And will it be only the UN development system that takes care of the SDGs, or is the whole system in demand? And how will the UN sort of um, organize its its cooperation on the SDGs? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot of questions. I mean, first uh, the one about uh, you know where's the sweet spot and, and basically where can we achieve political consensus? I would say at a global level we've achieved it. I mean that's what the UN does. It's a space where political consensus is achieved in areas and in, and I would say the what happened two weeks ago is historic. We've never had this kind of a consensus on this kind of document. And then it's very holistic, it's ambitious, it's integrative. And now the, the work is to the national level. And you need to have the same discussions at the national level. Now, what does that mean? How, do, how can it be bro broken down? Of course, we still have to do at a global level the, in, the work or the indicators. And I know there's a support from a lot of scientists and policy think tanks on, on that. But the real work that needs to be done now is at the national level, what does this mean? What does this mean for each country? And, and, and how are we going to hold our governments, our authorities, our duty bearers accountable for, for what we want to achieve? And, how, and, and 
if you remember the Millennium Development Goals, there were some countries that added a Millennium, added a goal, Mongolia, for example, or or that um, that that uh, decreased the time within which they had wanted to achieve certain goals. I remember I served in the Caribbean for some time. One of the problems in the Caribbean was the that boys dropped drop out of school, and so they had their own targets on that. And so I would say the SDGs and these 169 targets is the minimum, and, and we will certainly use our influence and the global system and in establish the review system in such a way that all the countries are strongly encouraged. You know, we're not, uh, it's a voluntary system, but we will strongly encourage every country to report on all the goals and targets. And we will try to establish systems of information where those reports and those reviews are going to be played back to the people you know, of those countries, so that uh, some accountability, the accountability can actually work where where it is relevant. The regional organisations also play an important role because in some regions you can go further. In some regions there is actually a willingness to do peer reviews and to actually have another country to come and look into our own business, etc., and, and vice versa. And so that might happen. And in other regions, uh, as you said, Johannes, uh, in, in other places it's not going to be so easy and there is just going to be exchange of lessons learned. And uh, I, I would assume that especially Africa, Europe, Europe but also maybe Latin America might go a little bit further than that. Um, the, the, the private sector I, doesn't have to implement all the 169 goals. I think the 169 goals is a, is a framework that every country needs to report on. But the private sector needs to see where it contributes. And now I, th I would say as an employer, you cannot be let off the hook for the target about the, the decent jobs. There, I already spoke about that. But then, otherwise, but but depending on in which area you work, through your value chains, through your emissions, through your environmental, let's say, externalities, etc., there are other consequences that have to be dealt with, that have to be discussed at a national level, but also at a global level. And believe me, the industries, the industrial groups, they engage in the UN. I get visits from them all the time, and they want to be part of it, and they actually want a more predictable uh, legal environment. So I would say that we've moved, we've moved away over the last 15 years from a private sector that was demanding an absolutely free for all. I don't think that that's, that that's requested anymore. There is a willingness by the private sector to have more regulation as long as it's transparent and fair and the same for all. And I think that the economic crisis led to, to that partly, where we, where we saw uh, what, what could happen if that wasn't the case. Um, the, the plans uh, by, by Brazil, China, but also the US and others to reduce their, their, their emissions of, of um, of carbon-based gases, I, I think that is a that is a very important um, component of achieving, let's say, of uh, reducing our uh, climate change to stay below two degrees increase, and and so we need more of that. Hopefully, the hopefully the the whole process of the sustainable development goal has contrib contributed towards energizing this. Has shown how the climate change links to the other, to the other goals and targets, and and uh, I mean it's not enough. I mean we're hearing Christina the figures. I mean I think here you have a, a lot of very competent speakers in the city, you know can speak to that. We need more. We need more ambition. I think that the idea of asking countries to come up with voluntary uh, targets is a good one. It helped to it helped to release some of the discussion. Away from you know uh, you know you must and I you know trying to get away from constraints, but now we need to encourage countries to do more. Uh, the UN system. And the UN system. Oh, this was an important one. Yes. <laughs> what what needs to change? 
I think we need to internalize some of these lessons. And uh, the first two, I already said them. I hope those are the ones you wrote down on your paper, leaving no one behind. And are we strengthening the relationship between duty bearers and rights holders? We need to internalize those. They're not easy ones either. Um, the, the next one is, we need to realize that this is not about 4%, but about 100%. So it's not about the UN, it's about everybody, and we need to make sure that we change our way of working so that everyone feels that they are involved. Involved in the, in the implementation, involved in the review process, involved in the policy debates about the future. As I said, the, this past process leading to the SDGs has set new standards in terms of inclusion and of participation, and uh, there is no going back. I just would like to add um, two points, maybe. Regarding the, the UN system, uh, you will remember Paula Ballesteros from Colombia when she said, the 2030 agenda has shown why we need the UN. And I think that is a, a great thing, because um, there is, especially in this country, there is so much criticism towards the UN. And, um, uh, and straight, sometimes I also, of course, every organization can always improve its effectiveness, that's clear. Um, but uh, you can't expect the UN to be um, more effective than others just because they sign, they are part of the UN Charter. I mean, uh, it, it's the national governments who fund the UN, it's the national governments who define how far the UN can go. And, uh, and it's similar in, in, to the debate we have here about the EU. The EU is, is very much dependent on what member states want the EU uh, to do and how progressive it wants it to be. Um, but I think that having um, shown its value, I think it is of course also important to show that these reforms will take place in the, in the US system and that the implementation of the, of the 2030 agenda is not limited to the development system. This is also very clear and it, then this also refers obviously to those international organizations which are not part of the UN system, like the international financial institutions. This uh, is, is, is an important tool. Um, and in that context, I also would like to say, um, we have talked about organizations hijacking goals, but I think it's also important to talk about organizations being tasked with implementation and being left alone by the others. Yeah, like if I think, for example, of Goal 17, which talks about the systemic issues. If, um, if, if the German government decides for international action, this is a task of the Ministry of Development, that means they are left alone by economy, by trade, by finance, and then it won't work. Then we will remain in the traditional um, area of, of, of development cooperation, and we know how, how much failure this, this implies. Yeah? So I think it has these two uh, sides, and um, and I think that uh, you are right in saying um, this is this is an uh, an important uh, responsibility of national debates to to point these risks um, out, uh, and I I hope that um, that we make we really make um, progress in that respect here in Germany in the next few months. Thank you very much, uh, the two of you. These were already perfect words for wrap up. I would like to add sort of my three things which I made, took away, of course, in addition to the two questions that uh, you've been uh, uh, asking, Thomas. I mean, in a way, what became clear to me tonight is that to be successful, the SDGs need to keep everyone busy, not to the same degree, and not all of the SDGs and targets to the same extent. But other than the, S the MDGs, which were an affair of sort of development, the development community and developing countries, the SDGs affect all of us and need to involve all of us. And it actually, it's a massive cooperation exercise, which um, and a communication exercise, I guess, where we need to reach out to communities and people, which we have so far not really sort of uh, thought of as part of our uh, our working environment. Second point: it's not going to be easy. Uh, constituencies need to be won over, hijacking needs to be avoided. On the other hand, also being left alone or being left behind needs to be avoided. 
And thirdly, the sort of the national level is crucial. We heard that. I mean, um, Germany, I think, will need to play a sort of a front runner role and can play a role model next year. But we also need the UN, which sort of enable the whole process and which will also be key in through its monitoring and evaluation process in sort of encouraging countries to to be ambitious and to aim for the um, sort of an achievement of the SDG agenda. So with these sort of takeaways, I would like to thank, first of all, um, Thomas for his rich input and discussion and also Emma for the great um, comments and, and reflections on that, on that. I would like to um, thank very much the audience with which um, sort of prompted uh, a very good debate. And I would like to remind you that next week uh, we're going to have another lecture on Thursday uh, in this series, which will be very different because um, Rudolf Stichwil, the founding director of the Forum of Internationale Wissenschaft, will actually take us back in time, back into the time of the League of the Nations and the founding of the UN, and will sort of um, reflect with us what kind of ideas of a world society, of how sort of global governance could look like, were actually debated at that time. And maybe this is uh, actually a nice contrast to what we debated today. Um, Dirk Messner, the AGIS um, director, will provide a comment to that. So please feel welcome. Come back uh, next week. Um, the next week session will take place at the FEB, which is also around the corner. So thank you very much, and enjoy the reception outside.